It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is to the Premier. On Friday, the government's Long-Term Care Commission confirmed what frontline staff and families of residents have been crying out for months, and I'm going to quote from that report. Long-term care homes were forgotten in the initial provincial plans to control the spread of COVID-19 until residents started dying. Now, just last week, the Ford government's Minister of Long-Term Care was still insisting that the government had acted immediately and done all it could. No one on that side of the House, not the Minister, not the Premier, is prepared to take any responsibility for the disasters that have unfolded in long-term care. So will the Premier finally do the right thing and ask his Minister of Long-Term Care to resign? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker. I, I reject your, your uh, premise in your statement. I have been a doctor, physician, family physician for, for decades. I came to politics because of issues surrounding long-term care that I knew both professionally and personally. And I want to thank the commissioners for their report, this early report, to help us uh, with guidance and to create transparency for the public. This is a, a very important commission that is nonpartisan. It is independent, it is transparent, and it is publicly facing. And I appreciate it hearing from all of the groups that want to be heard in this. Our government has worked relentlessly with a commitment like no other government in the history of this province for long-term response. After it was Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question. Speaker, I think it's pretty disgraceful that the minister is pretending that there is nothing in this report that is problematic. The report says clearly the government didn't plan to protect seniors in long-term care when COVID-19 was hitting our province. And that's a shameful thing to have happened. And somebody needs to take responsibility for it. Uh, the, the report only confirms what residents have been saying and what family mes members have been saying for months, in fact, for years. On Friday, CBC's Marketplace revealed that uh, there is routine abuse and violations that occur in most homes across the province. And there are virtually no consequences, no consequences when those homes break the law repeatedly. Now, sadly, this, this situation of, of a neglect and of abuse has become the norm in long-term care, completely unacceptable. If this happened anywhere else, what happened in long-term care with COVID, anywhere else, the minister Question. responsible would be offering her resignation. Why has the premier failed to do the right thing and ask for that minister's resignation? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. We look at the neglect of for decades by the previous government and supported by the opposition right here today. When you had the opportunity to deal with the deep, deep issues, the systemic issues in long-term care, you did not take them. Our government is the government that is committed to repairing, rebuilding, and advancing long-term care. And I am the minister who cares so deeply about long-term care that I have come after many years of serving the public, caring every day about patients and families, and doing my very best to serve them. And now I'm here serving Ontarians, and I will continue to be relentless, working with other ministries, working Response. across governments, and I would hope that you would be part of the solution in such an unprecedented situation. I will be relentless. Thank you. Thank you. I remind, stop the clock. I'll remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, what the minister hasn't figured out is this is not about her. Order. Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, come to order. 
I'll give you extra time. It's, about, you it's about what's happened in long-term care, and if there was that much neglect, she should have known and should Member have protected long-term care homes from COVID-19, should have protected those residents. She shamefully admits that she knew the system was a mess, and yet they forgot to plan forgot to plan for protecting seniors in long-term care. Families, residents, frontline staff in long-term care homes were not surprised by the commissioner's report. These are the same issues that they continue to plead with the government, and they were pleading with the government for months and even years to try to fix. The Friday's commission report really did feel compelled to tell the minister to actually take her study that she commissioned and received back in July off the shelf and start implementing it. Stop studying the study for for goodness sake, get some things done. No one's accountable. Nobody is. Nothing is changing Order. at all for people. And so the premier now has to actually do the right thing. And if she will not Question. resign, if she will not do the right thing and resign, Mr. F the Premier Order. of Ontario needs to fire his minister of long. Stop the clock again. Stop the clock. Minister of Labour must come to order. Start the clock. Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. And I would suggest to the uh, member opposite, please don't make it about me. Uh, I want it to be about Ontarians. And so, if you continue in the proper, proper process of why we are here, it is about serving Ontarians. It is about Order. repairing, rebuilding, and advancing long-term care. Order. And the actions that we've taken speak for themselves, starting very early. The Ministry of Health, the lead uh, on the preparedness plan, making sure that all across the sector there was integration. A, a group of experts, not only in public health, uh, Public Health Ontario, but on Ontario Health. Uh, all the expertise, whether it's in, in testing, uh, virology, many, many experts informing this plan. And so I, I agree with you. This is about Ontarians. It's about serving the people. And it is not about me. The Box. unprecedented issue that we've seen with COVID across the world, looking at asymptomatic spread, something that the world has never seen before. So now our government is... Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks so much, Speaker. My next uh, question is also for the Premier. Yesterday, uh, Ontario achieved a, a troubling new milestone as uh, total uh, daily case counts of COVID-19 soared to a record high. It's clear now that the failure of the Ford government's plan uh, to, uh, uh, to deal with the upcoming second wave, which we're now in, and make the necessary investments in things like testing capacity, smaller class sizes, staffing in long-term care, is having a devastating effect. Weeks ago, the Premier claimed Ontario was flattening the curve and hitting a plateau. And now he has to answer the question, is he prepared, finally, to admit that his government's plan for the second wave has fallen tragically, tragically short? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. We took steps very early on to prepare for the fall, our fall preparedness plan, keeping Ontarians safe with six sure. key pillars. And we've also put $2.8 billion into this plan across the board, making sure that we can respond to surges within our hospitals and public health facilities, making sure we have the strongest flu campaign in Ontario's history, making sure that we have the health human resources that we need to make sure that we can have the people that we need working in our long-term care sector and in our hospitals. We've been preparing for this. We are ready for it. We've already taken steps in four key areas with modified stage two. We're looking to see for the results. Uh, the, uh, there's a problem in the sense that there was Thanksgiving festivities that happened about the same time as we cut back and modified stage two in four areas. So we still have to wait to see the effects of those provisions, Response. but we are seeing the numbers starting to go down in certain areas. The total numbers are still troubling, but we are starting to see some of the numbers go down. A supplementary question. Speaker, uh, all summer long, the Premier simply ignored experts that were pleading for the government to protect kids in classrooms, seniors in long-term care, and to upgrade our uh, chronically under-resourced lab system. Instead, he's offered direction that is so inconsistent and so unclear that even his own MPPs are publicly calling for clarity. This weekend, two government MPPs wrote the Premier warning that people may start ignoring public health advice. 
and the member for Niagara West, as we all saw, literally posed for a photo where he violated public health guidelines with over 40 of his friends and family. So why is the Premier's own team challenging and outright ignoring his directions? Government House Leader to reply. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, uh, the member opposite will know that the, the members for Milton and Burlington uh, were responding to a challenge that is uh, happening in, in, in Halton, Mr. Speaker, where the elected officials there uh, currently disagree with their chief medical officer of health on how, this, uh, on, uh, how uh, stage two, if and when stage two should uh, uh, come into effect and halt. And Mr. Speaker, of course, we would expect that our members would attempt to intervene when there is those types of, uh, of disagreements. They did the right thing uh, in reaching out uh, to Dr. Williams, I would suspect, and I would hope that members opposite would do the exact same thing uh, when their municipalities uh, find themselves in the same situation. I'm going to ask the government, going to ask the government House Leader to withdraw the, uh, withdraw. the final supplementary. You, Speaker, people have been let down. That's the truth. People have been let down by this government's refusal to prepare properly for the second wave. They've been stuck in long lines, left waiting for test results. They've seen jobs disappear and businesses close. They've lost loved ones in long-term care. The Premier's focused on saving money. He was focused on saving money when he should have been focused on saving lives. And now his own MPPs are questioning him or outright ignoring health advice. Is he now prepared then? Is the Premier now prepared to admit that his government's planning for the second wave of COVID-19 was tragically a disaster? Government House Leader. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, as, uh, as I just said, the members for, uh, uh, for Burlington and Milton, I know that the member for uh, Oakville and uh, Oakville North Burlington also uh, have some concerns with respect to the fact that uh, in Halton there is a disagreement between elected officials and the Halton Chief Medical Officer of Health with uh, entering uh, stage two. As a result, the members uh, sought clarity from uh, the Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health, as I would uh, hope that uh, all members would do in instances where there is a clear difference of opinion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with respect to uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, measures, uh, uh, look, this government, we're very proud of all of the work that we have done. We will continue to fight COVID-19 with all of the resources available to us and by doing something extremely different than what the Leader of the Opposition would suggest, by working together with our friends in the municipal and, Response. and, federal and across party lines. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Okay. The next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. With COVID cases peaking, it's vitally important that we all follow the rules. The Premier, in his daily press conferences, implores us you know, social distance, wear masks, don't, you're, don't let your kids come home for Thanksgiving. And Ontarians across the province followed, followed his advice. But now we see a picture from one of the Premier's own team with 40 people unmasked. So could you please tell Ontarians why his own team doesn't follow his advice? Government House Leader. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for that question. Uh, to be clear, uh, the member uh, uh, in, in question uh, has uh, apologized for uh, uh, the lack of judgment in that uh, in that instance. Uh, uh, I have spoken uh, with him, as has the as has the uh, the Premier. We accept his uh, apology, and uh, of course, we encourage all members uh, uh, to do everything that they can to help us, help Ontarians, uh, uh, to flatten the curve and defeat COVID-19. And the supplementary question. Once again to the Premier, apology is great, but we need to set an example. You need to set an example. What's even more concerning is that the member from Niagara didn't seem to think that that was a problem. Like, are you really taking this seriously yourselves? Really? So it's a case of do as I say but not as I do. And it's not going unnoticed. Anthony Dale, CEO of the Ontario Hospital Association, said the member should resign from his parliamentary assistant role. That would set an example. Is the Premier willing to ask for his resignation? 
Government House Speaker. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, the, the, what the member did was uh, was wrong. He apologized. The Premier uh, and myself, we've both uh, spoken to him. But when it comes to uh, uh, following the rules and do as I say and not as. Uh, uh, as, as I do, Mr. Speaker, this is a, an opposition party that on day one, when we returned to this place after negotiating a cohort agreement, on day one, ordered that agreement, Mr. Speaker. So when order. it comes to listening for Tim, and doing to all that we can, when it comes to listening and doing Leader all the opposition, that we can, come to order. this is an opposition, Mr. Speaker, that within 10 hours of an agreement being reached on how to keep this legislature Order. Going, how to keep the business of the people being uh, enacted decided to ignore that break the cohort mr speaker and flood this chamber uh mr speaker so i would suggest to the member opposite uh, uh, take a good long look in the mirror okay. member for timmins come to order the leader of the opposition come to order the member for windsor west come to order the member for hamilton west and caster dundas come to order the next question, the member for Oakville. Speaker, my question is to the Associate Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the COVID pandemic has changed my constituents' lives dramatically by forcing them to work and spend much more time at home. I know we froze the time of use electricity rates and introduced a COVID-19 recovery rate of 12.8 cents per kilowatt hour to help them through a very difficult time. But what happens next? Could the minister please tell us what the government is doing to let Ontarios choose what's best for their family when it comes to electricity pricing? The Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the member from Oakville for his great work and a great question on behalf of his constituents. Because of our decisive action this past summer, insurance benefited from stability and lower electricity bills. We knew that when homes became offices and classrooms, that the laundry machine and air conditioner would need to run more. Mr. Speaker, insurance have had no choice but to use more electricity. That's why it was critical for us to provide stability and predictability. Starting on November 1st, electricity customers in this province will be able to choose a plan that best suits their household and lifestyle, with the option of choosing either time of use electricity rates or tiered pricing, which will provide a set rate for electricity up to a certain level of consumption. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians deserve to choose what works best for them and their families, and our government will always look for ways to make life more affordable for the people we're given the privilege to serve. Thank you, Speaker. And a supplementary question. Thank you to the minister for that answer, and I know that many of my constituents will appreciate the option to be able to choose an electricity plan that works best for them. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 has changed the way people work right across this province. Some may be spending more time working at their home, and other essential workers are spending much more time than ever at their workplaces. Can the minister please tell this House how the Customer Choice Initiative considers all Ontarians no matter what their work situation? The Associate Minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and through you, the member from Oakville makes an important point. Ontarians consume electricity in different ways, and they all deserve the opportunity to save on their electricity costs. Whether you work from home nine to five, or do shift work, or work multiple part-time jobs, customers use electricity differently. If customers use more electricity during non-peak hours like evenings and weekends, time of use may be better rate planned for them. But if customers use more electricity during weekday hours, tiered pricing can help them save. That's why we're offering both, Mr. Speaker, choice. Mr. Speaker, for all that insurance need to do to make that advantage of this program is contact their local dis distribution system centre, and they will be switched to the price structure of their Member choice. For Timmins, come to we're order. proud to offer stability and affordability, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to electricity for the people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. This week, the government's long-term care commission echoed a long-standing call from New Democrats, frontline workers, residents in long-term care to establish a minimum of standard of four hours per day of hands-on care per resident in every long-term care home in this province. This week, the Time to Care Act, which would establish this standard in law, is up for debate for the fourth time. There should be nothing left to debate. This is a long overdue and simple measure that will protect seniors and improve their quality of life. Will the Premier support it? Mr. Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker. And once again, I want to thank the commissioners for their early, early response. Uh, this is something that we look, we, we had been looking to to the commission for early guidance, if possible. And so we are very appreciative of that. 
And certainly, we've recognized the long-standing staffing issue in long-term care, the crisis uh, that was leading into uh, our government's uh, um, uh, situation when we took uh, in 2019 in the summer as a new ministry, understanding what really had not been done by the previous government. So clearly, uh, we take the safety and well-being of residents and staff in long-term care as a as our main priority. There is no doubt about the importance of their safety and the well-being and the care, the high-quality care that our residents need, and their complexity, understanding our residents are more complex than ever before. So we understand the imperative to addressing the staffing issue, Response. addressing the issues that are long-standing in long-term care, and we will continue um, to work towards improving care for our residents. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, the tragic reality is, since Mike Harris eliminated the minimum standards of care for over two decades ago, government after government has promised action and failed to deliver. The Liberals promised to re-establish the minimum standards in 2003. Before the last election, every Conservative in this legislature voted, voted to support this bill. The government's own staffing review, and now their commission, have called for this to be enacted urgently. When will the government establish a minimum of four standards of four hours of day hands-on care per resident in this province? The government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I uh, appreciate uh, the member's question with respect to private members' business. Uh, we'll be debating that, if I'm not mistaken, on Wednesday when uh, the House will give consideration of her bill. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. My question is for the Minister of Health. Over the weekend, former employer of the Premier's Chief of Staff, the Toronto Sun tabloid, in an act of state propaganda, mischaracterized the letter signed by two government members as pushback against the Premier, when in fact it was written to the Chief Medical Officer of Health and not the Premier. It was another example of this government passing the buck. Six weeks ago, during question period, I stood here and I asked the government for objective criteria and a framework. Why did the government refuse to publicly release transparent objective criteria prior to shutting down businesses in four regions across Ontario? Minister of Health. We have been very transparent with the information that we've published with respect to why some of these areas were put into modified stage two. It depends on a number of factors, including the number of cases, of course, the ability of our public health system to be able to deal with that in terms of contact tracing, testing, isolating, and so on, the ability of our hospitals to be able to manage that excess capacity if we have an overrun of patients with COVID-19, and of course, we consult with the medical officers of health in all of those areas. It's not just one person that makes this decision. It's Dr. Williams, it's the public health measures table, but it's also the medical officers of health in those particular areas, in the, in the areas that are now in the modified stage two, the local medical officers of health all agreed that this was necessary. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, this government continues to pass the buck. In one breath, they say they rely on medical experts and want the public to give them a pass on their botched use of emergency powers because they aren't doctors. In another breath, they threaten swift action and that they might bring down the hammer. But the chief medical, medical officer only provides recommendations. The decisions are supposed to be made by the premier and this government. Are they making the decisions or not? Because if they're not making the decisions and don't want any of the criticism, perhaps they should let the chief medical officer, who they like to blame, serve as first minister and minister of health. So I repeat, is this government making the decisions or not? Minister of Health. Well, in every case, all of our decisions have been made based on scientific evidence and clinical evidence. I'm not sure, Speaker, I'll ask the member through you, who she would like us to rely on to make these decisions. We have to make decisions based on the scientific evidence, based on the recommendations of the medical officer of health, on the people on the health command table, on the people on the health measures table, by a number of doctors, physicians who have volunteered their time to serve, by the medical officers of health and all of the units. This isn't a single decision that's made by everybody, anybody. This is a decision that's made by the political 
uh, advisors by all of us as politicians based on the recommendations of the medical officer of health and all of the other people that are giving us recommendations. That's what we should be making the decisions on. That's what the people of Ontario expect us to be relying upon. Thank you. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Speaker, we've said in this House many times and even more outside of it, Ontario's child welfare system is broken. It's an outdated system with only minimal changes through its over 125-year history. While there have been some improvements, small changes aren't enough. Apprehension, Speaker, seems to be the first choice rather than accessing the family issue and providing the right support. It's also clear that child welfare is so much more than just protecting children in the home. Unfortunately, Speaker, the previous government, helped by the NDP, let the system suffer. Speaker, can the Minister of Children and Women's Issues please confirm with the House that she won't keep the status quo, but actually help children in need? To respond, the, Minister, the Associate Minister of Women's and Children's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Whitby for that question. Speaker, no parent, no child, no family member should fear speaking to a children's aid society or asking for help. Children and youth should not be removed from their cultures, religion, faith, or communities. And, Speaker, poverty is not a reason to remove a child from a loving home. The culture in Ontario's child welfare system needs to change, and that's exactly what we are doing. We are moving from apprehension to prevention. We are focusing on intervening early and providing supports to keep children and youth with their families and communities as best as we can. When they do need to be removed, we are prioritizing family-based care over group homes and giving children and youth a stronger voice in the decisions about their care. Speaker, we know that children and youth who maintain connections to mothers, fathers, family, community, faith or culture have better outcomes. That's our focus, and that's what we're going to do. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, back to the Minister, Speaker, and, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Speaker, the, make, uh, the Minister makes an important point, that children and youth who maintain connections to their mothers, fathers, faith, culture or communities have better outcomes. Speaker, the impact child welfare has on individuals reaches far beyond the home. And in its current state, those in contact with the system have worse life outcomes. Changes need to happen, Speaker. And kids need a modern system that puts them and their families at the center. Speaker, can the minister commit to modernizing the child welfare system so that children and youth who have been left behind by the Liberals and the NDP will now have a chance at success. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to again the member for raising this important question. The member is correct that child welfare is about, about so much more than just protection. It is about community. It is about family supports. It is about education and building a strong foundation for success. And I can say, Yes, I can commit to changing the system for the children and youth and families in Ontario who need it. That's why I am working with my colleagues to create a better integrated system so that a woman fleeing violence doesn't have to worry about being separated from her kids, so that children who might have to be removed from their home are getting supports in school and don't fall behind, so that Indigenous children can remain in their communities and receive culturally appropriate care and stay with families. Speaker, redesigning the child welfare system won't happen overnight, but we can commit to the long-term work that is needed to achieve success and promote positive outcomes for children, youth, and families. Future generations are depending on us. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are not pleased to see that this Premier is rewarding Charles McVitie for his friendship and his political support. Instead of focusing on helping Ontarians to get through this pandemic, the Premier is distracted, and he wants to let McVitie grant arts and science degrees at his college. 
Today, the National Council of Canadian Muslims called on the Premier to distance himself from this man and his bigotry and to reassess whether this government will proceed with Schedule 2 of this legislation. And so I ask, will the Premier listen to NCCM and all other Ontarians outraged by this decision to support Charles McVitie's hateful views? The parliamentary assistant. opposite for a question. Mr. Speaker, just to be clear, independent review of degree granting has existed for decades under governments of all stripes. Factually, this institution has had the ability to grant degrees up to the PhD level under the previous government and since the 90s. Mr. Speaker, the reason we have a high quality of education in the province of Ontario is because parties of all stripes have supported the independent process and review of the post-secondary quality assessment board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. The Premier should not be doing political favours for his close friends and die-hard supporters, people like Charles McVitie. I've written to the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and I've asked the Chief Commissioner to look into whether this bill is a violation of Ontario's Human Rights Code or Canada's Charter of Rights. Given the long-standing track record of Charles McVitie using this college as a platform for discrimination and harm against protected groups, and the concerns raised by NCCM, among so many others, will the government do the right thing and pull this bill while the Chief Commissioner looks into the matter? Again, the parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, just to be clear, enabling legislation for degree granting has existed under governments of all stripes, and Mr. Speaker, it is reliant on the independent process of the post-secondary education quality assessment board. We look forward for the review, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, in March, this government announced their COVID-19 action plan which was largely comprised of tax deferrals for businesses instead of the real help that they needed, like commercial rent relief. Just a few weeks ago, the Treasury Board President told us that he is planning to collect an astonishing 100 per cent of those tax deferrals, despite being businesses being closed with no cash flow, and we are now in a second wave shutdown to slow the spread of COVID-19. It is clear that the March action plan failed. It is clear that there was no plan for the second wave. The Premier was taking a summer victory tour while Ontarians were waiting for back-to-school plans and lining up Order. for hours to get a COVID test. Speaker, will the Premier's Jim. budget include a real second wave plan, not just deferred supports? Will the Premier make investments commensurate with the health crisis that we now face? And how will Thank you. Thank you. The parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And to the member opposite, uh, what the Premier was doing was touring this province, engaging with the small businesses throughout this province, Mr. Speaker. These are mom and pop shops. And, and behind every single one of those closed doors, Mr. Speaker, is a family trying to provide for their loved ones during a very difficult time. And I reject the member's statement that there has been no direct uh, response. There has been to the tune of $11 billion, Mr. Speaker. That's been tax cuts, employer health tax cuts, to the tune of $300 million, $175 million to keep hydro rates low, $300 million just announced for the regions that are affected by the revised stage two, Mr. Speaker, and that's going to go help with their fixed costs, whether that's hydro, whether that's those taxes that we spoke about, Mr. Speaker, or even with property taxes. And so while the member opposite considers that consulting with those hard-working businesses in Ontario is a waste of time, we disagree here on the government. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, you know, as the PA lists these figures and they claim that you're, you're committing for support, the FAO points out that this government is sitting on $9.3 billion in reserves and unallocated funds, which could be invested in programs and supports for Ontarians to keep them safe. In fact, you've fallen short on long-term care, Order. on education, on small business, and in, in fact, when Order. you look at cutting off the emergency benefits that the most vulnerable Ontarians rely on in OW and ODSP income supports. Speaker, since March, as the PA knows, the Standing Committee on Finance 
<clears throat> and economic affairs held hundreds of hours of hearings across industries, sectors, um, hearing testimonies and witnesses from restaurants to spas to tourism operators, Question. tech hubs. In fact, we have this book of ideas that have been presented. Why are we still waiting for supports for the much needed supports that have been called for? What are you waiting for? Order. Parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, certainly a lot to digest in that question, but I want to share with that member a lesson that my parents taught me when I was nine years old in, in our little convenience store in Rexdale, and that is when times are good, you put away for a rainy day, Mr. Speaker. And that's what this government did in its first two years of its mandate, and that's why we're able to provide that direct relief, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The member opposite mentions the FAO report, and I want to remind the member that the FAO's first quarter report is a snapshot in time, and it would be irresponsible of a prudent government to spend its entire year's budget in that very short period of time. So we are providing that uh, direct uh, support, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we announced $300 million for the revised Stage 2. Those supports are going to continue in a coordinated effort with our federal partners in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, to fill the gaps of this joint program that is released, and that's why we will have those further support measures announced in that budget, and I look forward to continue Fine. to assist the great, hard-working business of this province through the budget. Stop the clock. Minister of Labour will come to order. The member for Scarborough-Guildwood will come to order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, we know that this has been a challenging period for many of us, but small business, and particularly northern small businesses, have been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Through the Speaker to the Minister, what is our government doing to support northern Ontario small businesses? The Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, I'd like to thank the member from Perrick Sound, Muskoka, for his question. As we continue to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak and kickstart the economy in Ontario, we know that investing in businesses in Northern Ontario will be critical for our long-term success. That's why we introduced the Northern Ontario Recovery Program to support hardworking businesses in Northern Ontario that have been impacted by COVID-19. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the CEO from Sault Ste. Marie Chamber of Commerce said they're very pleased to support the Northern Ontario Recovery Plan, our program. Through many consultations with the governments of Canada and Ontario, it was evident that many small businesses were unintendedly falling through the cracks of support programs for a variety of reasons. The Northern Ontario Recovery Program will help address that issue by supporting the many businesses that are investing in ensuring a safe environment for their employees and customers so we can have a safe today and healthy tomorrow. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you for that response. It's clear that our government is listening to the people of Northern Ontario and stepping up to support them. Can the parliamentary assistant share more details of the Northern Ontario Recovery Program and the type of projects that it aims to support? Again, the parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you for that question. The program is being administered through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation and will provide targeted funding so business can, businesses can install the necessary upgrades and adapt to the challenges that they have with COVID-19. Applications will be open until December 31st, 2020, and companies can apply for assistance for things like building renovations or adding on new construction to support physical distancing and other safety measures, installing employee and customer uh, safety installations like plexiglass shields, sneeze guards, equipment purchases, including PPE, and marketing for new business admit new business initiatives and restructuring of business operations so that they can thrive during this COVID-19 challenge. This has been a challenging period for many of us, but I know that with this investment, Bonds. the resilience of Northern Ontario will return from this crisis stronger and better than ever. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. On Friday, the Conservative government's own long-term care commission recommended that Given the physical care and psychosocial support that caregivers provide, long-term care residents must be provided consistent, safe access to family members and loved ones. Speaker, I couldn't agree more. 
Since the first wave of the pandemic, families, experts, and the official opposition NDP all sounded the alarm about the mental, physical, and emotional suffering among isolated residents. It motivated, it motivated me to table the More Than a Visitor Act, which this government supported but has not moved forward. Will the government follow their own commission's recommendations and pass the More Than a Visitor Act to allow for safe, consistent, meaningful caregiver access? Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And that is exactly what we've done. Uh, with the essential caregivers, the, the dedicated, the designated essential caregivers. Each resident is able to designate two care providers that will be allowed into the home. Uh, if there's an outbreak in the home, one caregiver will be allowed in. They will be trained in the appropriate um, necessary uh, equipment that they are required to use, the donning and the doffing, as we say, the putting on and the taking off of, of this equipment. We recognize the absolute necessity to support the mental well-being of our residents in long-term care. And this has been, a, it was a difficult decision early on um, to limit, but that was done through the Chief Medical Officer of Health to limit visitors into the home. But they, the, each resident, I want to reinforce this point, can designate two people uh, to be their essential caregiver, to be allowed into the home. Spons. And one person, one caregiver in the case of an outbreak. So even in the situation of an outbreak, these people will be allowed into the home. Yeah, Thank, yeah. You. Supplementary question. Thank you. Speaker. This government has a responsibility not only to keep people safe from COVID, but from the harm of isolation as well. They're failing miserably on both fronts. And it's important that the minister listen to this so she knows the reality of what's going on as opposed to what she wants to think is going on. Yeah, yeah. This weekend, Anne wrote to me. She said that she has been fully shut out of her mom's retirement home, even with no outbreak. Joan also sent me an email concerned about her husband who lives in long-term care. She said, quote, I don't want another six months of not seeing him due to spread. The situation needs to be improved now. Speaker, I have hundreds of other emails exactly the same as this. Will the Premier fast-track the More Than a Visitor Act and provide the staffing levels, PPE and training to actually facilitate and Question. enforce safe access for caregivers? Mr. Long -term care. As I, as I said, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and to the member opposite, this is a situation that already has been addressed. We will continue to take additional measures. If you want to provide the names and the, ho the, home, the homes uh, of which you speak, then I would be happy to take that back to the ministry to fully understand. Uh, yeah, I would, be, I would be happy to address that. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Education. This government has repeatedly mentioned the, important, the importance of providing mental health services in Ontario, especially in the middle of this crisis. Yeah. To that effect, we need to be aware of the incredible pressure that education workers of all categories are going through, whether it's teachers, bus drivers, principals, administrative staff in schools, and in school boards. I was told that right now, education workers of all kinds are feeling the exhaustion as if it was the end of November, with no relief in sight before the holiday season, which is a whole two months away. My question on behalf of all these exhausted workers is what support is the minister offering for education workers that are working in this extremely challenging environment? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. As you know, the Roadmap to Wellness was established back in the early part of March, and as a result of COVID, we had to look at finding resources that would help the children in the schools, but also help the instructors, and we invested in virtual care. We invested initially $12 million, an additional 14.75, and we created helplines both for students, Kids Help Phone. We established lines for the frontline workers and first responders, and we created a network of supports in a difficult time when where face-to-face -face services will not be uh, easily provided. In addition to that, we also ensured that in school there were additional resources invested, and the additional Response. resources. 
brought in additional mental health care workers to assist the teachers in the work that needed to be done with the children. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you. And again to the Minister of Education on the same question. Education workers are working tirelessly and for many well beyond the normal hours to be res responsive to public health requirements in addition to their workloads. There is added work and stress from having to react to public health notice of an outbreak within very short time frames. And I'm sure you're very well aware of what they need to do. Another example for the secondary schools with the hybrid model is the fact that school calendar has not been adjusted to provide teacher with any preparation time to prepare for the second quadmaster. So a consequence of this is also the cancellation of the exams, which gives no gap in between the first quadmaster and the second. So they have to jump into the second uh, subject with no time to prepare. Question. These workers are at a risk of burnout and they need some breathing room. Will the minister work with all parties involved to give education workers and students some breathing room to protect their mental health and support to parents through this initiative and make sure that it is included in the budget? Thank you. <laughs> minister of Education, you have Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I want to. I want to build on the message from the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Uh, as the member opposite will know, and I appreciate the question, realizing full well the stress that the pandemic has imposed on our staff. And these are people who work very hard, who have families themselves, uh, and I think who really are trying to do their very best in a very impossible circumstance. Uh, that's the basis for why in June, when we announced the grant for student needs, we invested an additional uh, $15 million in mental health supports. But since then, we've announced $30 million more to support mental health for children and likewise for staff boards have the latitude to utilize those funds to, to support staffing uh, and to support the mental health resilience of our frontline workers. Speaker, it's also why in September we funded a $10 million allocation, the only province in Canada to mandate training for health and safety for COVID uh, for, uh, for permanent teachers as well as occasional supply teachers as well Spons. as for mental health. We appreciate how this, the impact of COVID has had on our frontline people in all Ontarians, and we'll continue to be there for them, for our students, and for all families in Ontario. The member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. My question this morning is for the Premier. Today, the Hamilton Spectator reported that Hamilton Health Sciences and St. Joseph's Health Care are short, 224 staff, in the middle of a pandemic. Hospitals in my community are in dire need of nurses, lab technicians, psychologists, PSWs. The list goes on and on, Mr. Speaker. The workers on the front line of this pandemic need support. So my question, what is this government going to do to provide the relief to these hospitals that are so understaffed? Mr. Health. I thank the member very much for the question, and this is one of the key strategies in our fall preparedness plan, keeping Ontarians safe, is having the health human resources that we need in order to deal with COVID-19. We have already put money into the nursing guarantee program for new nursing graduates. We've also given a temporary increase in pay to March 2021 for personal support workers and have also increased their uh, salaries for the uh, people that are working there and bringing people back to uh, provide them with uh, benefits as well. So we're very cognizant of the issues. We're in regular contact with the hospitals, as well as with the hospital association, and we will make sure that the necessary staff will be there to serve the patients in your community. The supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I find this answer disturbing because these hospitals are understaffed right now. I mean, they need help now. And if that wasn't disturbing in its own right, we've also learned that as of October 15th, 113 staff have tested positive for COVID-19. And I would just like to add the majority of these are women. Uh, Michelle LaRue, the VP of Hamilton Resources at Hamilton Health Sciences, had this to say. The pandemic is taking a toll on our staff and physicians, both at home and at work. Despite this, they continue to show up every day and simply go above and beyond to care for our community. So my question, what is this government going to do today to ensure that these frontline workers get the support they need to stay healthy and to continue the fight against COVID-19? Well, we're all very grateful for the work that our frontline health care workers have done since the beginning of this pandemic. They have come to work each and every day. Uh, that's physicians, nurses, PSWs, staff. Everyone has come forward, and we are very grateful to them for doing that. 
but we know that they need to be able to have the resources to stay safe themselves and to keep their families safe because at the end of the day they go home and they're concerned about passing on COVID-19 to their families. So we have provided them with the personal protective equipment that they need. We've increased the supplies dramatically. We've come forward and worked with Ontario companies who've come forward to produce uh, some of the PPE on as, as a sideline to their regular businesses. They've been preparing the gowns, the masks, they've been preparing the face shields, uh, making sure that people have the supplies that they need. We've also made Response. changes to allow for people to be moved around within hospitals. If there are some people that aren't there because unfortunately they've become ill, we can move people from other parts of the hospital. We didn't have this ability before. This is a temporary measure, but. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, when asked about the ongoing conflict at 1492 Lambac Lane, the Premier referred to Indigenous land defenders as bad apples. He went on to suggest that he knew exactly what people in the Indigenous community wanted, broadband. There's no doubt, Speaker, we need better rural broadband. But if the Premier took the time to listen, he would know that Indigenous land defenders are talking about treaty rights and a resolution to outstanding land claims. Speaker, I will acknowledge that I'm not in a position to speak for Indigenous land defenders, but I am in a position to ask the Premier if the government will agree to enter into land claims negotiations with the traditional Haudenosaunee Confederacy chiefs and the Six Nations BAM Council to seek a peaceful and respectful resolution. Okay. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for raising this important issue. You know, the, um, the issue that is happening right now in Caledonia is deeply disturbing to many of us. Um, we are now in the 98th day of um, basically a community that is in upheaval. And I have uh, great faith in the judicial system. Um, when they made a ruling on Thursday, I have great faith in the OPP keeping that peace. But uh, you know, I, I, will, uh, I will accept and respect your call. I do believe that the federal government does have to step up and start having some true conversations about how to resolve these issues because it is incredibly disruptive to the community, to the individuals who are protesting, and ultimately Response. to public safety. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the Solicitor General's response, and I do agree the federal government does have a role to play, but I believe the provincial government has a role to play as well. This is not the only ongoing conflict that's happening. Right now, multiple First Nations are suing the government over Bill 197 and the fast tracking of the environmental assessment process. Chief Solomon of the Muskoweq Council said, and I quote, Sadly, they're using COVID as a decoy to restart the economy at the cost of the environment, the waters, the animals, and our livelihood. Speaker, First Nations across Ontario are raising serious concerns that their treaty rights are not being respected. Their rightful and constitutionally guaranteed input on decisions about their Question. land and resources. So I would ask the Solicitor General um, will the government settle with First Nations around the environmental assessment process rather than dragging this through the courts? The parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And thank you very much for that question. Uh, Minister Rickford has formed a round table to add to the consultation with respect to this. He's brought in a number of the chiefs from Ontario to make sure that we have a fulsome consultation around 197, and all of that information will be fed back to the rest of the ministry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier, the Ontario energy rebate is going to be removed for common areas of many condo and apartment buildings as of April 30th next year. That means that hydro bills for power used in those common areas will rise by over 30 percent. 
One condo in Toronto has calculated the impact on their residents would be $140 per unit per year. Why, Premier, are you dramatically increasing the hydro bills for almost a third of condo owners and tenants in Ontario? The Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And let's just start off by answering this by saying that that government, that opposition party, supported the Liberals to give us the highest energy rates ever in our history and the highest level of debt in our history, Mr. Speaker. Our government is reversing the Liberal policies that created the hydro mess. We are stabilizing our electricity system and keeping electricity bills affordable through a 33.2 per cent Ontario electricity rebate. Had we not done that, Mr. Speaker, rates would have gone up an additional 30 per cent under the watch of the Liberals and the NDP. The Liberals spent 15 years adding billions of dollars to our electricity system by signing contracts for power we did not need and could not afford. We are rebuilding an affordable electricity system that prioritizes Ontario's electricity customers. Speaker, in the meantime, Ontarians don't deserve to pay for the mistakes of the Liberals. That is why our government will continue to subsidize and ensure that we keep the bills as low Response. as possible and support families and businesses of this great province. And the supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier promised to cut hydro rates by 12 per cent in the last election. And since then, rates have gone up almost 4 per cent, and many condo and apartment dwellers will be seeing big hikes in their hydro bills next April. Why did the Premier break his promise, and why is he gouging so many apartment and condo dwellers? Associate Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I said in my last response, we cannot fix 15 years of mismanagement by the Liberals, supported fully by the NDP and opposition, uh, overnight, Mr. Speaker. But please be assured, we are working on this. We, if we con con continue down the Liberal path, as I said earlier, 30% more on those hydro bills. Is that what you want to support? Is 30% more of your first air? I don't think so. Ontario's paid $37 billion extra for electricity from 2006 to 2000. 2014, says Auditor General Bonnie Lysak. Mr. Speaker, we are doing what we can to ensure that we keep those bills affordable, that we keep those bills for business and seniors and people across our province as low as possible. And we will not forget that the Liberals and the NDP caused the mess that we're currently trying to fix and ensure, again, affordability, reliability, and a system we can be proud of. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Last week, the government brought forward the Ontario Rebuilding and Recovery Act. Now is not the time to delay delivery of priority infrastructure projects, including public transit and highway projects. It is the time to accelerate the building of key infrastructure projects to create jobs and build a strong foundation for a strong economic recovery. Can the minister uh, the Associate Minister, please advise us whether this bill will commit to accelerating rebuilding and growth in this province. The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and to the member, thank you for the question, and I cannot agree more. Of course, safety will always be our priority, particularly during this very difficult time. But our government needs to play a dual role in making sure that we stimulate our economy in the months to come. This legislation will make sure that we extend the tools that were previously assigned to building our subway uh, projects to extend to other transportation projects, other health care, and other long-term care projects. Mr. Speaker, it's incredibly important that we make sure that goods continue to move efficiently throughout the province of Ontario, that people can continue to go to hospitals for the surgeries and services they need, and that we continue to build capacity in our long-term care sector. The supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. I understand the proposed legislation would reduce barriers in the planning, design, and construction of major infrastructure like uh, highways and public transit networks and support uh, growth of transit-oriented communities, which are very important in my area. Can the Minister please elaborate on how the Ontario Rebuilding and Recovery Act will help the people of Ontario, and will she call on the opposition parties to support this bill? The Associate Minister. 
absolutely. And again, thank you to the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, in this legislature, we heard countless times from the members opposite about how important it is to invest in public infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, in this legislature, we've heard countless times about how important it is for us uh, to provide funding and to accelerate the building of highways that are in their respective ridings, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, every single day during question period, um, the members opposite always inquire about the status of health care as well as long-term care capacity. This bill will help us achieve this. It will help us invest in our critical infrastructure so that we can make sure that Ontario prospers uh, in post-pandemic world, Mr. Okay. Speaker. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Health. Um, we have seen uh, through the uh, uh, plan for a hospital uh, that uh, many non-urgent surgicals and procedures were uh, cancelled through uh, the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, this has led to 129,000 uh, patients added to the already long list uh, for surgery and procedures in our hospital. Uh, we've also say, seeing that uh, many people are diagnosed later uh, for cancer or other uh, diseases, which will require even more interventions from our hospital to hopefully bring them back to health. Uh, my question to the minister is, I am curious as to uh, the last uh, stats that were shared was question. that it was at 129,000 backlogs for surgery. Could the minister update us as to how many people are now waiting? Minister Hell. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. This is a, a serious concern. It's an issue that we did address in our fall preparedness plan, keeping Ontarians safe, is reducing the backlog. It was at about 189,000 procedures and surgeries that we were behind. We have been dealing with that as part of our fall preparedness plan in creating the extra space in our hospitals to allow for both COVID patients to be treated as well as patients who need to have these surgeries. Because as much as it's, it's terribly sad that we've lost patients to uh, COVID, but it's equally sad if we lose people because their cancer surgery has been delayed or their cardiac surgery has been delayed. We want to make sure that we can take care of um, all of those patients in a timely way so that they can recover. So we have dealt with that as a very serious matter. We're approximately 95% uh, of our orthopedic surgeries right Response. now, about 87% of uh, cardiac and COVID surgeries. So we st that's compared to where we were this time last year. There's still work that we need to do, but we are taking a new approach to this, which I'm pleased to discuss in the supplementary answer. Unfortunately, that uh, concludes the time we have available for question period this morning. There being no further business, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.